To mark the return of sport, The Athletic is running a series counting down the greatest comebacks in history. So, we thought that we'd explore the science of a comeback. With 53 minutes of the 2005 Champions League final played, AC Milan held a 3-0 lead over Liverpool at the Ataturk Stadium in Istanbul. What followed over the next six minutes would be the basis for one of the most unlikely triumphs in football history, as Rafael Benitez's side enacted a comeback for the ages. But what happened that night? More specifically, what actually happens to players and teams to allow comebacks to take place? Well, from Liverpool's perspective, it's easier to explain. According to Moritz Anderton of the Institute of Psychology at the German Sports University in Cologne, the process, quite logically, begins with a team's belief in its own strengths. To provide further detail, Anderton stresses the relevance of Bandura's self-efficacy theory. Bandura, the Canadian-American psychologist, cited four sources crucial to an individual's ability to succeed in specific situations and in their accomplishment of certain tasks. There are four sources of self-efficacy. They are 1. Mastery experience. That refers to a player's ability to draw strength and conviction from moments of excellence or accomplishment in their past. 2. Vicarious experience, which is the belief that what has been achieved before by others can be replicated. The third is social persuasion, which refers to the motivating and instructing role of coaching staff, teammates and supporters, and factors which reinforce belief in capability and make it more likely that the individual will respond to a task with sustained effort regardless of its difficulty. And finally, the fourth source, the physiological state of the players themselves, which involves the visualization of a successful comeback, which are in turn reinforced by the events which occur during the process itself. So, the foundations of Liverpool's miracle and their sources of self-efficacy are clear. They had already achieved a remarkable comeback in that season's Champions League, beating Olympiakos 3-1 in the group. With neat symmetry, they'd also proven themselves capable of finding three second-half goals in a do-or-die situation. And there was a further harbinger of success that night. As he would in the final, Benitez made a successful substitution in pursuit of a deficit. At Anfield, it was forward Florent Cinema Pongol for Jimmy Traore. In Istanbul, it was Dietmar Haman for Steve Finnan. And Benitez and his players had reason to believe their opposition could be vulnerable. Five days before the final, Milan had surrendered a 3-1 lead to Loli Palermo at San Zero. It was the only time all season that they'd conceded three goals in the league, and with some symmetry, two of them were conceded in two minutes. More broadly, for English clubs in 2005, success in a Champions League final was still wedded to the notion of the unlikely comeback, following Manchester United's dramatic victory over Bayern Munich six years earlier. United and Liverpool may well be deadly rivals, but it remained an encouraging precedent. But when presented with a big lead, suggests Moritz Anderton, a team can have two different emotional responses. A positive one, in which the team remains aware of any potential danger, their collective senses remain heightened, and the integrity of their tactical game plan is preserved. Or a negative one, in which a reduced state of tension is reflected physically and mentally in a lack of aggression or declining discipline. There may also be a psychosocial consequence too, with communication between different players deteriorating and coaching from the sidelines becoming less impactful. At half-time in Istanbul, Steven Gerrard's role changed as a result of the Haman substitution and perhaps exploiting Milan's failure to adopt to that change, he was able to loiter unmarked in the box before heading in John Arnaurice's cross. It began the comeback, but also a sequence of contrasting reactions on the pitch. The head of the Institute of Psychology at the German Sports University in Cologne is Professor Jens Kleinert and part of his explanation for comebacks suffered in sports is based on the concept of defensive thinking. Professor Kleinart reasons that there could be two types of player, process-orientated and results-orientated. The process-orientated player accepts any situation as a challenge, regardless of how hopeless it may be. By contrast, the results-orientated player sees in situations the opportunity to win or lose something, and in cases when losing is likely, this player, quite naturally, is vulnerable to having his thinking confirmed by negative experience. This is the moment when the fear of failure arises. Now, in this instance, the negative experience is Gerard's goal, and the consequences would show dramatically over the next six minutes. 
When a results-orientated player suffers the fear of failure, Professor Kleinart explains, the effects can be contagious, spreading quickly through a team and creating dysfunction. When simultaneously confronted by an attacking team whose optimism is being validated within a game, which can perpetuate further belief and confidence, the fear of losing intensifies. The defensive way of thinking increases and mistakes become inevitable. Now, Professor Kleinhart and his team stress that this is theory rather than a complete solution, but it makes sense, and the evidence appears overwhelmingly in Milan's second-half performance following the Gerrard goal. When Vladimir Schmitzer scores, it's from space he's been afforded by Kaka's baffling decision to disengage from the game and adjust the strapping around his shin pads. Liverpool work the ball across the pitch, and with Kaka unable to recover his position and Clarence Seydorf scrambling to fill the space, Schmitzer is able to shoot through goalkeeper Dida, whose feeble attempt at a save was a further suggestion of trouble ahead. For goal three, the sequence of Milan mistakes is even more unusual. Jamie Carragher is allowed to carry the ball deep into their half. Then he plays a 20-yard pass to the edge of the box, which Milan Barosh holds and lays off for the onrushing Gerrard. In the first instance, Pirlo and Maldini fail to block Carragher's telegraphed ball. Instead, they back off him, failing to pressure a defender who, in that area of the pitch, is well outside of his comfort zone. And in the second, neither Gattuso nor Cafu responded quickly enough to Gerrard's run from deep to prevent a penalty from being conceded. As a sequence, it's extraordinary. Four of the very best players in the world in their position all made mental mistakes at precisely the wrong moment. And of course, that pattern would remain throughout the rest of the evening too. Jerzy Dudek would make a miraculous save from Andrei Shevchenko, and Jimmy Traore would make a critical goal line clearance. Even after Liverpool had levelled the game at 3 3, their moments of validation just kept coming. Conversely, Milan were broken. Serginho's wild penalty in the shootout would set its tone, with Shevchenko's final feeble penenka and his pained, defeated expression becoming the unwitting emblem of the night. He, like his teammates, was among the very best in the world at the time, and yet all his quality had been claimed by the nebulous science of the comeback. To mark the comeback of sport, The Athletic is running a series counting down the greatest comebacks in history and will be counting them down between now and September. Well, you can get 40% off an annual subscription to The Athletic if you want to check out the comeback series or indeed any of the other work produced by our world-class team of journalists. Follow the link in the description to sign up now and thank you for watching today's video.